So good morning, First Baptist Church. We're here to celebrate so many things to hear today, but the most important thing is lifting our God's name up high. So let's stand right here as we proclaim him as God. The head that once was crowned with gold is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash
put our hands together, church, and just praise him right now. Amen. And just to prove the point that his name is Victory, let's please focus on the baptism. Let's have a seat, please. Good morning. It's good to see everybody. As uh, we're here this morning celebrating baptism, it's uh, really a joy and a pleasure for me uh, to be able to do this for uh, two uh, very special people uh, here in our church. Uh, so let me go ahead and start off with my uh, daughter. As uh, many of you know, she came up a couple of weeks ago, and um, we've been having some discussions about baptism. And so this morning, I get to do that uh, for her. And so it's really a, a great a joy and an honor uh, for me to do that. So come here, sweetheart. Come here. Come here. Say hi. Can you say hi to everybody? All right. Well, after many conversations, uh, as most of you know, that uh, baptism is a big part. Um, we know that it doesn't save us, but it's a, it is a big part of uh, salvation. And so uh, Leighton has actually recently received uh, the Lord uh, as her, Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And so uh, now we're following up with baptism this morning. So, uh, Leigh, is it true that you confess Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior? Yes. Yes, Amen. Well, it's my joy and my honor to baptize you this morning, okay? So go ahead and hang on to my arm. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Go ahead and go. And the next brother in Christ, uh, this is David Juarez. Some of you had have a... I've had the privilege of meeting David. Uh, David has actually uh, been coming to our church. He's originally from California, um, but the Lord has brought him here uh, through the military. And so it's been a joy to get to know him and spend some time with him. Uh, we spend uh, actually over an hour in my office uh, talking about the things of the Lord. And I was able to share some of my testimony with him. Uh, and in that, uh, he actually uh, received uh, Jesus as his Lord and Savior as well. And so we're following up with, with baptism. And so, uh, David, is it true that you confess Jesus as your Lord this morning? Yes. Amen. So, David, it's my pleasure and my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, uh, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You good, brother? All right. Well, as we continue to worship, let me pray for us this morning. Thank you so much for being here. Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for allowing us this opportunity to witness the work of your spirit. Father, we know that you're at hand, Father, and that you are watching over us. And uh, this is evidence of that, that you're still at work in the minds and the hearts of people. And so, Father, as we've had this privilege of watching and witnessing these baptisms, we pray that the rest of our time uh, together would be honoring and glorifying to you, Father. We entrust our time to you. Thank you so much for your son. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for all that you do for us. And it's in Christ's name that we pray, amen.
Amen. If you could please stand with us as we continue to worship and just thank God for this amazing country. God bless America. White with foam, God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home, from the mountains to prairies to the oceans white with foam God bless America my home sweet home God bless America my home Let me ask you to be seated, if you would, please. For a moment here, we want to pause and recognize our veterans. I want to tell you that uh, for, for many years, I have appreciated those who served our country in the military branch of any kind. My, my wife's stepfather was a Marine who served in the Pacific Theater during the Second World War. Uh, on my mother's side of the family, I had an uncle who served in the Marines and was one of those who was trapped in the Incheon Reservoir in the Korean War and made it out alive. My dad's side of the family, we had another Marine, my uncle who did several tours in Vietnam. So I, I grew up and have all my adult life appreciated those of you who served our country but one of the great privileges of my life as a pastor is to pastor this church in this city and make friends with our service personnel, men and women, and especially those of you veterans. We want to recognize you. So if you would just please stand where you are. And as a church, we salute you as best we know how. We want you to know that what you did matters, and we appreciate what you've done. I've talked to many, many veterans and tell them thank you for the service, and nearly all of them in one way or another say, well, you know what, no, that's not necessary. I signed up on purpose. That doesn't matter. You signed up, and you served, and we're the direct beneficiaries of that, and so we say thank you for your service, all right? God bless you. You may be seated. We're going to go to our offering time now. And in that, I want to say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I'm glad that we're back to the point where we're passing the offering plate. We went almost, well, about 19 months or so without being able to do that. It is a part of our worship as we respond back with what the Lord has done for us and we, in turn, give back. So that's part of what we do here. But I also want to kind of kick off our annual emphasis on Lottie Moon and our Christmas offering, which goes to benefit uh, international missions. And so as we go over the next uh, six or eight weeks, we'll be taking up that offering as part of this offering. So if you decide you want to give to Lottie Moon, then you can take one of those envelopes and just write your name on it and Lottie Moon across there, and we'll make sure it gets credited to the right place, okay? And as we take up the offering, our praise team's going to lead us in a song of worship. I'll talk about worship in a little bit. But this is a great time for us to pull all of that together in music and offering in our hearts as a point of worship today. Let's pray together. And so, Lord, now we ask that as we go into this phase of our worship experience today, that you would remind us that all of this is yours, 
and we respond based on our awareness of that. So we pray that you would bless this offering as we seek to honor you with the work of your kingdom in this community and beyond. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. us. And God, I pray, Lord, that the way we live our life, the way we love each other, the way we just commit our lives to you, that that can be our expression of gratitude. That can be our expression of love to you, that our life is just an act of worship with the things we say, the things we do, the way we just love our city, our community, our church. God, let that be our worship to you. And during this time, may we draw closer to you. May we understand you more, knowing that you're the almighty God above all things. We love you, God. Your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. And as you're being seated, happy Thanksgiving. That's that's an underwhelming response, I just have to tell you. Are you thinking that I'm jumping the gun? This morning, (laughs) I was getting ready for church this morning, and I looked at my watch, and I knew that I had plenty of time. And then the next time I looked at it, it had jumped a full hour, and I panicked. So did you just panic when I said Happy Thanksgiving? You think that you're a week away? So I want to say to you this morning, Happy Thanksgiving, uh, for a couple of reasons. But one of the primary ones is as we begin today, I want to give you some assignments, all right? I want to give you some practical things to do as we go into the Thanksgiving season that, as far as I'm concerned, starts right now, all right? Take your Bibles and go with me to the book of Psalms, number 105. Psalm 105 will be there in just a few moments. But as we go into this, I I do want to pause for just a little bit and acknowledge something that might be like new information for some of us. I know many people... 
uh, friends of mine who love, absolutely love the Thanksgiving season. And uh, they, they just like it better than Christmas, many of them do, just because of the, you know, some of the stuff that gets hung on Christmas, commercialism and all that seems to get pushed to the side. So this may be that season for you. Maybe you're one of those who really loves what we do at the Thanksgiving season, but I know that there are people who do not see it quite the same way. As, for instance, as, as we look around us today, just take stock of the world as we see it around us, and you may well come to the conclusion that there's not a whole lot worth being thankful for out there. Economically, inflation, seems like the world has just gone crazy in some ways. And so as we look out there, we see the culture wars that are going on. We see all kinds of reasons that help us get to a conclusion that essentially says, this thing's spinning out of control. I don't like what I see. There's pressures on me. There's pressures on my family. Uh, what is there to be thankful for in this Thanksgiving season? You wouldn't be alone if that's you. I've known through the years a number of people, like I said, they really don't like it. For instance, I'll, I'll give you just an example of one family who seem to have crises that emerge during the Thanksgiving and into the Christmas season, and that's historically true for that family. In one given year, the matriarch of the family who was uh, uh, right at 100 years old, pretty close to that, passed away, and a week later, her daughter passed away. And then about three weeks later, uh, there was a shakeup in the family, and so there was a split between a husband and a wife. Through the years, that same family during this stretch of, of the seasons that we're talking about experienced all kinds of other problems. Another divorce occurred during that time, or at least the beginnings of a divorce. There was a miscarriage in there pretty close to Thanksgiving Day, and all of those things come together, and that family, or at least some of the members of that family, really would rather not do Thanksgiving at all. Thank you very much. How is it for you in this Thanksgiving season that we move into? today. I know that when you look at me, the first thing you think of is that guy reads Shakespeare. <laughs> but in case you don't, let me read a little Shakespeare for you. Shakespeare gets to the point here that some people have a real problem when it comes to gratitude and the gravity of an attitude of ingratitude just kind of hovers with them. And so here's what Shakespeare said. Blow, blow thou winter wind. Thou art not so unkind as man's ingratitude. Thy tooth is not so keen because thou art not seen, although thy breath be rude. Shakespeare may be onto something there as it relates to gratitude and ingratitude. Are you one of those people who looks around and goes, you know, there's just not that much reason to be thankful. Well, I would suggest to you that there is. There's always reason to be thankful. I take you way back in history to a pastor who was in Edinburgh in Great Britain, Dr. Alexander White. And Dr. White was famous, it is said, of his prayers from the pulpit. And so as he would come and pray, he was always finding something to be thankful for. And in this particular occasion, uh, in this rather open air kind of venue in which that church was meeting, uh, it was one of those bleak, cold, foggy, windy, nasty weather days in Great Britain. And one of the church members, as Dr. White began to move towards the, the podium to speak and to pray spe specifically, one of his church members looked at his friend next to me and said, I bet you he can't find anything that he can be grateful for today. So Dr. White got up and he began his prayer this way. Dear God, we thank you that it is not always like this. <laughs> Are you a person of gratitude? As we go into the Thanksgiving season this year, can you be thankful for something? My answer is yes, you can. 
As a matter of fact, I would even say if you call on the name of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there are things you must be thankful for regardless of what the economy does and regardless of what kind of nutcase societal things happen over the next six or eight weeks. You can be thankful. You must be thankful for some things. Psalm 105 verses 1 through 6 we'll read here. I want you to know as we get into this, though, that verses 1 through 6 is really just the call to worship for the rest of the psalm. So it's an introduction, in other words, and the psalmist writes and says, here's, here's this, and I'm going to give you three words that come out of this, either directly or indirectly, and I want them to be action words for you as you go into the coming weeks, and we celebrate Thanksgiving now for the next six weeks when yeah, let's, let's go ahead and extend it to Christmas, all right, and make it a full-blown season of thanksgiving. Psalm 105, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he ordered, O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Here we have 10 different imperatives, 10 different statements that are charging us to some certain kind of behavior. I'll take those 10 and pull them down to three and lo those will be your homework assignment for the next six weeks or so. So, here's the first one. It is the word testify. Now, we draw this from verse 1, actually the first part of verse 1. And if your English translation is what mine is, it actually says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, which is a good translation. Hear me say that first. It is a good translation. But there is opportunity here based in the way the Hebrew reads that helps us understand that there is also this thrust in there that actually colors that give thanks. I would suggest that it gives the foundation for giving thanks as the psalmist has said it there. And so the Hebrew word here literally translated means to make known. Give thanks to the Lord. In other words, make known these things. Coupled with that is the next little phrase. English says, give thanks to the Lord. But the word to also, as a secondary interpretation, can also mean about. So give thanks to the Lord is right. It's the thing to do. It reads that way. But if we take this nuance in the Hebrew language here, it also says, testify, make known the deeds about the Lord. Make known his deeds. That's in verse 1. Look at the rest of that, and we'll see. We're going to work our way through the whole thing, but let's go ahead and get this here. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, or, as I have said, testify about the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. We drop down to verse 2. The second part of verse 2, sing to him, sing praises to him. Here it is. Tell of all of its wondrous works. Verse 5, in its totality, remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. The primary thrust of this psalm is that we should remember God's works and testify to them. Testify is a word that we used to use in church a lot. Any of you remember having testimonial services? I remember as a kid, my dad's church, and every once in a while, he would say, you know what, before we start the sermon today, let's just hear what God's doing in your life. And as a kid, I loved that because I didn't have to listen to my dad. <laughs> but I became sensitive to the fact that when we testify individually about what God has done or is doing in our lives, then it sends a message to everybody that it's not just a preacher who gets something out of God's word. Testify. It's the word. Make known his deeds. Make known these things about God. So it begins with this point of reference of God's promise, but then it moves quickly to that point of reference of God fulfilling his promise. 
That's the thrust of what we find in this. And so when we come and remember, it should move us to give thanks, but it also should move us to testify, to make known what God is doing and is fulfilling his promises in our lives. That testimony centers on God's activity based on his promise for us. That's the essential thrust of this first word, to testify. There's, there's an aspect of this that we need to not miss. I'm going to come to that part, the corporate part, but let me just pause for a minute and let's do a little bit of individual application here. In other words, I would like for you to take the truth of this and put it on and wear it for a while. How long has it been since you testified about God's work in your life. If it's based out of promises that God kept, which it is, that's what this text is promoting, then let me ask you, what has God promised you in your life that he has fulfilled? In other words, if we were to have a testimony here, a testimony service here this morning, and I pushed it into your lap to say, okay, you preach the rest of the sermon. What is God doing in your life? How long has it been since you testified to that for somebody else? You know, one of God's primary, I would say God's the primary way that God would have us do evangelism is you and me as individuals going out into the community testifying to what God is doing in our lives. And we've dumbed that down as evangelicals through the years and we've somehow pushed it on to the, the pastor or maybe we pushed it on to what I call God's hit squads that uh, we train in evangelism. We send them out and all the rest of the church goes, okay, let's see what they can do this time. That's not God's primary way. His primary way is you taking the good news of Jesus Christ, the promises that God has fulfilled in your life, and you go out and you testify to that fact. How long has it been since you gave testimony to God's activity in your life? That's where we start. It's the word to testify that we begin this process. But here's the, here's the nuance that I, want, I, want, I really want us to get a handle on. The psalmist now is actually writing to the gathered community of faith. He's really not addressing individuals here as much as he's addressing the full gathered assembly of the community of faith. And so these words are directed towards the group. It's directed to the body, if you will. So let's just stop there for a moment. Let's hover over that and let's just recount a few things in our experience as a church. What do we have to be thankful for this season as a church? I'm going to give you three examples, or at least three. Here's the first one. This is going to sound a little bit crazy, but stick with me. I think one of the great things that we have to celebrate this year at Thanksgiving that we testify about is the fact that we're here. <laughs> Here's what I mean by that. Unless you had your head stuck in the sand for the last two years, you are very familiar with all of the different pressures that have been on our society, businesses, families, churches, because of COVID pandemic and all of the stuff that has come with that for almost two full years now, we have been under this incredible pressure. And for me to say, we should be grateful. We should be testifying to the promise of God kept on behalf of this church is we are still here. Many churches are not. I know of other cities and friends of mine, pastors who know of other places around them where those churches are not here anymore. That's true here in El Paso. Some churches did not survive this. And yet God somehow chose to let us still be here. We should be thankful for that because we are still here. Now, I should be honest with you, some of you, I'm looking out across and I see who's here, and some of you understand fully when I say some of us carry deep scars over the last couple of years. 
Not only are some churches not here anymore, some pastors are not pastors anymore because of the pressures that were brought to bear on the kingdom of God and his church in American society at least. And I don't even know that much about what's outside of America. I know enough about Texas to know the fact that God allowed us to be here today is a something for us to testify about. But that's not enough for us to just look backward and say, God... Thanks for that. We're good. Church has changed. Society changed. And so many people still go to churches that are split right down the middle over the whole COVID reaction thing. There's some hard days that this church went through over the last two years. And God chose to let us still be here. You know what that means, among other things? It means we're not done. There's still work to be done. And we should hold on to that awareness as we testify to the goodness of God as it relates to that. Here's another one for you. This morning in the first service, we saw Eric Jimenez baptize two people. Uh, one an adult, service member, and one was his child. I mean, Eric's child. What an incredible thing to see God move in the lives of people for his glory. You know that since September the 1st, roughly, was that 10 weeks ago, our church has baptized 10 people. We have more waiting to be baptized. Two weeks from today, we'll have a big baptism service. I think that uh, the uh, Chinese church is gonna come and they have several, and so we're gonna baptize some people. You know what? Praise God for that. God is still in the business of transforming people's lives. And so anytime someone goes through that baptistry, taking a public stand as a follower of Jesus Christ, testifying that he has saved them from their sin and given them new life, and so they celebrate that with the picture of baptism, buried for the old life, risen for the new life in Christ. When that happens, we should have a party here. And so for 10 different individuals since we started the year, a, a great balance between adults, at least one in their 50s or 60s, and others, you know, lower adult age groups, all the way down to children. We had another one come this morning in the early service to say, I want to follow the Lord in baptism. God is at work in this church. We should not take that for granted. We should celebrate that. We should testify certainly that's worth giving thanks for, right? Well, that's a little weak, but that's okay. Hang in there. I know. I know you're just hearing it for the first time. We should never just be just ho-hum about seeing people give their lives to Jesus Christ. So one other thing that I think our church should be grateful for and that we should testify about is that for well over 100 years now, it's actually closer to 150 than it is to 100, but for well over a century, God has had his hand on this church in this location. I don't mean just this plot of ground. I mean the borderlands area. And in that, he had established a beachhead we're not the only ones in town. We don't even want to, we don't want anybody to think that we think we're the only ones in town. We're in a lot of other good churches doing good work for the kingdom's sake. But I speak for us. We're the ones with the, with the Thanksgiving assignment here. And as we testify, we should come back and recognize that God put a beachhead in this part of the city, called it First Baptist Church, and for over 100 years has said, get out there and make a difference in this community. And so for over 100 years, we've been doing that. And God's still working through us. And so we're called to build other beachheads out there. And so now, at least since I've been here, and I know it started before I got here, but I've been following it now for over four years, almost four and a half years, where I have watched as a group of this church membership goes down to 9th Street every Sunday morning and builds a beachhead for the gospel's sake in that difficult part of town taking the good news of Jesus Christ to people who would never 
just voluntarily show up at our church. God is at work in this church and through this church. We're not the only ones. That's happening all over the city. I know that. I know many of our pastors with a passion for Jesus Christ and the gospel message. We're one of those people. And so this year at Thanksgiving, one of the things that we have to be thankful for, one of the things that we can do is testify to the glory of God that he is still alive and he's still changing the lives of people. That's the first word. Some of you are getting a little bit concerned that we're spending so much time on the first word and it's already lunchtime. So let me give you the second word. Second word actually grows out of the first one. First word was testify. Second word is worship. We find this in the second part of verse one. This word, we're gonna see this again in just a few moments, but the second part of verse one, oh, give thanks to the Lord, or as I have said, uh, testify, make known these things about the Lord. The second part of that is call upon his name. Let me just pause for a moment and let's do some personal application again. The picture here is worship. Not only do we give thanks, not only do we testify, make known these things about God, but we also call upon his name. This is a, this is a practice of worship. But we struggle with this word. Not just we in this room, but all of society, I, I think this is one of those real struggles that many Christians have. An hour and one minute ago, according to the clock back there, just to let you know there's a clock so they know they tell me when I'm done. Uh, but according to that clock, an hour and one minute ago, the Dallas Cowboys kicked off for their game today. An hour in, I'm sure they must be hopelessly behind by now. But maybe not. Who knows? If you do know, don't tell me. I'm recording it. I'll watch it at home. Here's why I bring that up. Many Christian people are more attached to the Dallas Cowboys than they are to God himself. I've known people through the years. I knew one man in a church that I served named his firstborn son Dallas. I went to his office. Everything about it. Dallas. He had been to every, I mean, he's a meager living. I mean, he, he made ends meet, but he didn't have a whole lot of extra money, but he had been to every Super Bowl the Dallas Cowboys ever played in. He saved a lot of money over the last 25 years by not having to go. <laughs> but if you talk to him, I'll promise you he was going to talk to you about Dallas before he talked about anything else. He's a great guy, Christian, served the Lord. But Dallas probably most days edged out God just a little bit in that. How about you? I, I'm not suggesting that you're that way about the Cowboys, but uh, you know, in Thanksgiving, one of the idols that many of us trade in and let God take a break during Thanksgiving is the idol of family. Now, Teresa and I, over the next couple of days, will be here uh, part of this week, most of this week, and then we're going to go and we're going to meet all of our kids and grandkids for three long, loud days <laughs> in one building. We're doing that because Teresa loves our kids. <laughs> okay, I do too. And we're going to do that because it's, it's a good thing to do. We're going to do Thanksgiving early, okay? Some people, when it comes to this time of the year, especially, but really all year long, their family, if it's, if it's on one of those scales, you know, where, you know, the weight, you know, pull. So if, if it's between God and family, some days family's gonna get more weight. What do you worship? Or maybe I could ask it to you this way. Who do you tend to worship? A lot of us do pretty well with Cowboys. I mean, some of you are smart enough not to be fans of the Cowboys. I know that, but uh, I'm, not, I'm one of those guys who's been for years. But, but, you know, they're just, it's a football team. It's a business if you really want to get right down to it. It makes no sense to worship that. Some of us don't have those kind of problems, but we do like to worship ourselves. 
It's easy to put ourselves on the throne and say, what I say matters most. That's the essence of sin, just in case you didn't know. So on this Thanksgiving season, as you remember what God has done and as you testify to what God has promised and fulfilled in your life and you give thanks because of that, it should drive you to worship. So part of the assignment for you is to go back. Don't wait till Thanksgiving week, right? I mean, if, if you wait till Thanksgiving meal and the only thanks that you do is around that little table and whoever's there with you, if that's all the thanks you do, you're missing the opportunity to go deeper with God. Let me, let me use this ridiculous example to help you with that, okay? When you're gathered around that big turkey and you're about to cut it and have a meal with your family, don't forget that it's not a great day for the turkey. <laughs> so use that before you put a bite of turkey in your mouth. Think about, have I been thankful? Have I been remembering Am I worshiping God today or am I just going through a national holiday? Worship, it's a key thing that we do. So let me give you, let me pull back the covers a little bit and let you see and then I'll move on to the last word. This week, actually early this week, uh, I was up in my study and I was doing a number of things and this chorus came to mind. It was a chorus that we used to sing as, my, as a family, but we also sang at some of the other churches where I served. And uh, it was a chorus. Well, I'm not gonna sing it for you because you pay Elvin to sing, not me. But um, in this chorus, as I was going through it, you know, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. As I was working through that, it dawned on me, I bet you that's a passage of scripture. You know what? It is. You know where it is? Psalm 105. So I looked it up and it's Psalm 105. And I went, wow. And so a sermon was born just like that based on a chorus that I was singing that didn't even know that it was scripture. But I, because as I was thinking back through, we're getting ready for this trip and, and I was thinking of what God's done in our family. You all know you've prayed our kids through so many things since we've been here. And I was thinking about all those things. It just caused me to just kind of worship a little bit, singing that little chorus. God reminded me that it must be from scripture. I found it here and a sermon was born just like that. So remember, and as you remember, testify. Let somebody know. As you gather around with your kids or your grandkids over this holiday season, talk to them about what God has done in your life, in your family life. And then for us, as we get together in our little groups, whether it's a Sunday school class party or the church uh, Thanksgiving meal that'll be next uh, Sunday night here, as we gather together, let's remember, let's review, let's rehearse the details of what God has done here and let's worship. So the last word grows out of those words. The last word is embrace. This goes back to that nuance of the first verse where it says call upon his name is a call to worship but it is also a call to investment with God. We see it also in verse four and I'll read that one. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his peace continually. In other words, when it comes to your Thanksgiving practice, let the memories that you have spur you to memories that are yet to be made. Embrace God. Here, here's the line of thinking. It's a direct cause and effect. If I can look backwards and trace God's hand in my life or in our life corporately, and that causes me to recognize he made promises and he kept his promise. He's trustworthy. He's worship worthy. And so if I do those things, doesn't it make sense that he's developed a track record with us of being trustworthy? And so as we go into the days ahead, embrace him. What is he yet to promise you? What promises has he made that he's not fulfilled yet? Teresa and I, have one of those situations. We have a family member, I won't tell you who it is at this point, but 
We have a family member who has uh, really made some bad choices. And so they kind of, well, I started to say they kind of wandered away from God. They didn't, they sprinted away from God. Been a number of years ago. And in the midst of some of those really tumultuous days for us, spiritually and emotionally and otherwise, God gave us, gave to her first, confirmed it with me. So together we stand on this promise that God has given us, which is this one will come home. That doesn't mean live in my house. I promise you that's not what that means. It does mean that they will come home to God as king in their lives. We believe that. We're holding to that biblical truth that was given to us on that account. Some of you know the feeling. You've got family, loved ones who have wandered away from God or sprinted away from God, and you're just heartbroken over that. If you can look backwards and see God's hand at work in your life that causes you to worship him today and testify to him about what he has done, don't forget to hold on to him for what you don't have yet. Get a promise from him. If you don't know what that means, talk to me and I'll talk to you about how to go to scripture and let the Holy Spirit teach you some things about embracing God. The past is not the future. God is God of both. The best thing we can do is hold on to him. Three words. It's 10 imperatives pulled down to three. Here's your homework assignment for Thanksgiving. Testify. Remember, praise God for what he's done and testify to people about that. Worship as you do. And thirdly, embrace. See where God is at work today and hold on to him. Let's pray. And so, Lord, we come just having scratched the surface of this incredible psalm. My prayer is that you would reach through the clutter of our minds and the busyness of our schedules and the disappointments of what we find going on around us, all of those things that would say to us there's no reason to be thankful this year and help us to, to camp out in Psalm 105. Help us to see those things later in this psalm that you introduce in the first six verses and then help us to find ourselves there and may this Thanksgiving season be the most vibrant and spiritually transformational that we have ever experienced. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. We go to invitation time. Basically, this is a time that we build into our service that allows you one last opportunity whether it's coming down to talk or pray with us, Edgar will be down here, I'll be down here. Uh, whether it's to come down here and do that with us or right there where you are, just do business with God. Something happened with you today. The Holy Spirit said something about your life. This is our last opportunity before we go out there where all the distractions are there again. And we make decisions for the Lord's sake in our lives today. That's what this time is for. If that decision, maybe you don't even know what it is, but you know you need to talk to somebody. That's what this is here for. We'll be here. Okay, let's stand and sing together. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the sin.
Living Christmas tree tickets are on sale now for $5 in person or $6 online. You won't want to miss this special time of Christmas celebration with your family and loved ones. You can help us build the tree that will hold singers for the Living Christmas tree. Join us after the second service on November 28th in Price Hall. Find a list of guidelines on our website at fbcep.com lct. We are now accepting donations for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, which enables international missions. Please prayerfully consider giving at fbcep.com give. We want to invite our families to host two to four international college students. Often, these students never set foot in an American household while they're here to study. If you would like to host international students for your Thanksgiving meal, please contact Sam Patton or Martha Poe. Our entire church family is invited to the annual Thanksgiving banquet on November 21st at 5 p.m. The turkey and all the fixings will be provided by our kitchen and Thanksgiving banquet team. You just bring yourself and your family. Donations will be welcomed during the event to help cover the cost of the meal. A new season of Upward Basketball and Cheerleading starts in January 2022. We have lots of players so far, but we need volunteers. If you would like to volunteer, please see the kiosk in the Great Hall or contact Tom Trumbull. Now is the time to provide Christmas presents for children in need in Mexico. Crossing Borders Ministries has been distributing Christmas gifts to impoverished children in Mexico since 2001. Visit the kiosk in the Great Hall or go to crossingbordersministries.com to learn more. We will have a training for Grace Place Community Center volunteers on Monday, November 29th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Go to fbcep.com missions and click on the VOMO link to sign up. The flowers on the altar today are dedicated to Jim and Margaret Kaler in honor of their 38th wedding anniversary. Deepest love to both of you from William, Karen, Matthew, and families.